The following is a video presentation of a morning worship service at Orville Baptist Church. Living thing that moves on the earth. 
At this point, I usually would say, well, I'm glad to have you here, and visitors are welcome, and here's the event for the week, and uh, we'll get to that. But after, after reading from the book of Genesis, I think you'll notice on the uh, very front of your bulletin, today is uh, Second Day of Human Life Sunday, in which we uh, profess, and we boldly profess, that we um, we believe in the Second Day of Human Life. And uh, part of that reason, there's many reasons, and Ultimately, part of the reason is what we just read, is that life is given, is a gift, it is created, it is made by God himself, all life. He is the very source of life. And as such, because of what we believe, we believe life is precious. We believe that, that life means something. We believe that all life, all people, all men and women, are created in the image of God. Most Sundays, this kind of goes straight into a, an abortion debate and argument. I think there is times it's appropriate to do that. In 2014, the, the numbers that we have on legal abortions, ones that were reported, that the most likely were more, there were 652,639 performed in America alone. That is still 652,639 too many. But I do want to share something. Abortions actually only decline. I'm actually seeing a kind of an annual around 2% decrease every year. Keep praying. Keep voicing what we believe about life and what, what, we, what we believe about humans and what we believe about God and His creation. I also want to share this because I think it proves and I think it, it speaks to the world in, in which we live in. Um, I, I, I nearly wept. This has been maybe two months ago. Uh, an article came across, and this has been going on for a long time. It was the first time that it was really put in mainstream news publications. Uh, I believe it was CBS. Um, I don't remember, but once it, once it first hit CBS, it, it, went, it went spread to all the, all the other news outlets. Sometimes it was boldly made a news story. Other times it was kind of stuck under the rug. Uh, but they did a story on Iceland. And uh, there's something going on in Iceland right now that's um, not talked about very often. And they're not alone, but they're, they're kind of the, the forerunners, so to speak. Uh, in Iceland right now, it has been going on for, for, for quite some time. There's a practice of, of eugenics. And essentially their goal is to eliminate all Down syndrome through abortion. All. Um, and they're, they're essentially saying this is a good thing. That as we eliminate anyone who, who might possibly have abortion, we're going to remove that condition completely from our country. And they're kind of applauding their efforts. Now, I think that is just, um, I think it's heartbreaking. Because as, as people that understand, the world can't make up its mind about what we want to be. We, we have no idea the kind of people we want to be. We, we have no idea the kind of stuff we want to stand for. And so one country one day will say, we need to give Down syndrome people all the benefits that, that we all enjoy as free Americans. Then the next weekend, another country will say, we want to eliminate all. I mean, don't you see? Life is so very precious. We are going to be a people who boldly proclaim and freely say that we believe in the sanctity of human life. Because life is a gift from God. And men and women, no matter what condition, are made in the image of God. We are people who celebrate that. I know that sounds like a, a morbid way to begin our, our service this morning. It's not. We're here to celebrate life. I'm glad that I have life this morning. I'm glad that I, I know the giver of life. And that's who we seek to worship. We ask for his help in worship uh, this very morning. There's a couple of announcements. If you look in the very back, uh, there are the statements um, for um, tithings and uh, for offerings. So if you want to get up as your, as your only way out, uh, please do so. I want to echo um, Joan's, Joan's uh, comments earlier. David, so good to see you. Daniel, good to see you, see you both here. Um, go to the prayer list. I think the, the best thing 
about what Joel mentioned today this morning is we can be a people who celebrate. Um, we are people who pray for them. Very sick. A lot of people are feeling sick right now. A lot of people. And we're also praying people. We're also celebratory people. And so as we go to this prayer list and as we continue to lift each other up and as we get updates, we're also people who go back to the Father and worship. That's kind of the whole point. In fact, I'll argue that's the point of prayer. Not the sole point, but one of the main points that Paul makes in his letters is that prayer gives us an avenue in which we go back to praise. We pray, and then as a result, we also go back to God to worship Him for what He has done. And His will be. So we can continue to do that this week. And then also, I'll be quiet here. Remember Tuesdays, um, we, we still need help. Over in the Hayes Fellowship Hall, beginning at 4.30, we do feed uh, the homeless with help from, from Concord. Really appreciate your ministry. Uh, you, are, um, you are welcome. And, and more than that, you're invited love to see you there. We need people, we need bodies um, who, can, who can just show people uh, in, our, in our area, show our neighbors we love them, we care about them. Uh, so, so just come and, and um, just get to know our neighbors. And spend some time doing that. It's a, it's a blessing for them. It's also a blessing for you. And so I welcome you and encourage you to do that. And then also continue to think about um, our food pantry. Um, we, we, we're still taking donations for that. We got low after Christmas. Uh, we're, we'll need all the help we can get. Um, Orville has answered that call so many times, and so I'm so proud of our church. And uh, anytime our food pantry gets low, we make a little announcement, and then it builds right back up. So uh, consider uh, donating to that cause and um, feeding our neighbors. <laughs>
<laughs> it didn't take you very long in that situation to realize that's a terrible idea. <laughs> it kind of started with on February 13th. Just that alone, you're like, oh, this is going to be bad. It doesn't take very long to realize that's, that's horrible. No matter what we're talking about, this is just an illustration being used for in, in conjunction with Valentine's Day, but no matter what we're talking about, there's a reason why that situation is universally bad. Because it has a terrible motive. It's horrible. It's horrific. And I even said I want to show her how much I love her and appreciate her. That's not the way you, you do that. That's the way I do that. I had all the wrong motives. For, for one, I, I'm not even asking what she likes. I said, you know, my own chocolate, my, uh, a restaurant that I really like, putting no thought into a car and all that kind of stuff. No planning, no strategy, no nothing. I was just plain lazy about it. And so just, just take Valentine's Day out of an illustration by itself. Apply it to anything. I, I, just try approaching your very own job at work with that same type of motive. Or I should say lack of, of motive. Try approaching your job with, um, with a terrible motive or, or laziness. Or maybe go to your boss and say, I know you told me to do it this way, but I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. You're going to be fired in one day. You're gone. It doesn't work. And I think a sad reality is the similar way in which the church is viewed in, internally. We'll never admit it out loud to one another or to other people. Christians won't do this. I don't mean just here. I mean anywhere. Christians don't, don't express inward thoughts very often and inward feelings very often. We'll never say that loud, but it's more like a weekly holiday every Sunday. It's much more like a weekly holiday, not just a time of worship. It's almost like we feel obligated to celebrate, much like next month. Many of us will feel obligated. Do we do it because we want to, or is it because it's just culturally appropriate to buy a car for Valentine's Day? Are we showing you year-round, or just one day out of the year? Much like church? Are we showing it week by week by week? Or is it the one day out of the week which we feel obligated to do it? It's the wrong motive. A sense of obligation to do church life, to worship, whatever you want to call it. All things that come with following Christ. To do that obligation is a terrible, terrible motive. To do it from a loving heart is, is much different. And across the globe this morning, you're going to find this very problem that I just said. In churches all around the world, churches all around the country, you'll find this very situation. Now, again, I'm getting the part before the force again, but our, our first instinct, and we talked about this a little bit recently, if you've been in a relationship long, long enough, you've been married, you, you know it, our first instinct, instinct is to make up for it. We want to make up for something we've done. I, I screwed up Valentine's Day. We buy you something. I forgot your birthday again. Let me, let me buy you something. I lost my timber once more. Let me buy you something. And all of a while, there's a spouse sitting to the side saying, I just want you to, to love me and show it to me. <laughs> you don't have to buy me anything, to get me anything. Just to show me you love me. And before we jump into our text, let me, let me preface. Let me, let me say this. If you heard all that and you thought, that's right, we shouldn't make God feel that way, then I've communicated the, the very wrong thing. It's about our motive. Why is it we do what we do? It's not about making God feel heartbroken over in the corner. That's not what we're talking about. Why is it that we're doing what we do? Why is it we want to perform ministry? Why do we want to make disciples? What's our motive for these things? It's our motive for church life, missions, education to one another. Obligation or is it Love from the heart. We've got a lot to go through this morning. We're going to finish up at, uh, chapter 15 of Acts. We're looking at our motives for ministry and how that motive affects our ministry. So let's jump right into it. Let's get us up to speed real fast. We're going to attempt to go through Acts 15, the, the remainder of it. At this point, we're still in that letter that's been sent from Jerusalem. Remember? Jerusalem Council sent a letter to the church in Antioch. I'm going to read from verses 27 through 35. We're going to be really quick with this first part, okay? Very, very fast. They've met, uh, the council's over, uh, they've aligned themselves with the Holy Spirit's work, and they've said that man is saved by grace, not by works. And so James and the elders, they sent this letter to Antioch to, to inform, them, inform them of this. We've been addressing this the past two weeks, really. And so pick up in verse 27. I'm, I'm not, I don't have time to rehash everything. Pick up in verse 27. I'm going to read all the way through verse 35. 
Now make a couple of notes. Okay, so let's just let's just walk through the text really fast. This first section will be really, really fast. Okay? Verse 27. Therefore we have sent Judas and Silas, who, them, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. Verse 30. So when they were sent away, they were down, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. After they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. Verse 34 then. In addition, it says, but it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Verse 35, but Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others, also the word of the Lord. Very, very quickly, the church sent Paul and Barnabas to Antioch, right? They sent them this letter, and then they also sent two of their own, Judas and Silas, and I'll tell you why. Remember what Paul and Barnabas were preaching. They were preaching, you're saved by grace alone, not by the words of your hands. And the Judaizers in Antioch were saying, you've got to be a Jew first, then you can be a Christian, then you can be saved. Because you've got to uphold the law of Moses first. You've got to, you got to uphold the law. Then, including circumcision, then you can be a Jew, then you can be saved. And so what the Judaizers say, Paul and Barnabas went by themselves back to Antioch. and said, here's the letter I got from the Jerusalem church. They're going to say, that's not from them. You, you, you're just saying that because that's what you believe. That, that didn't come from them. And so the Jerusalem Council sends two of their very own and says, no, this is our stamp we're putting on it. This, this is Judas and Silas from Jerusalem Church. This is our men. We're, we're sending them with Paul and Martha so you will know the truth. We have, we have come together. We have said, you're saved by grace. It's not by the works of your hands. It's not by the law. It's not by circumcision. It's, it's, it's us together. Unanimous here in Jerusalem and a line of the Holy Spirit. We're sending this letter. Now, I love verse 38 so much. Just, just half of it. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And what did we spend so much time on last week? Church unity. We talked really part two of church unity. True unity in the church is found in unity with the Spirit. You cannot have unity inside the church without an alignment, without adhering to the will of the Spirit. You can't do it. It's impossible. There is no such thing as true church unity without true unity with the Spirit. They align themselves with the will of God and the guidance and the movement of what the Spirit was doing. So a fractured church asks the Spirit to place a rubber stamp on their own plan. The United Church says, Spirit, what would you have us do? God, what would you have us do? We spent a lot of time in that last week. And so not of a means for salvation, but for the sake of fellowship, they asked that they refrain from some things. Remember this? They said there's a lot of men who are still Jews. They're saved. They're saved by grace. But it's in their culture that they have some things with food and it, just for the sake of fellowship. Don't do these things. It's not about being saved or not being saved. But for the sake of, of being, being brethren, essentially. Have some common ground. Don't do these things. If you do that, you'll do, you'll do well. So it's just a, a wonderful thing for the church and young. And that brings us to verse 36. And depending on your Bible, you may have a, a heading there. Mine says the second missionary journey, uh, which this event becomes known as. And if you stop reading earlier in verse 35, and you, and you didn't go on and didn't continue, it sounds great. Oh, they're rejoicing. They're happy. What a wonderful thing. Uh, just can't get any better. And then you keep reading. And then you go down further. We're about to encounter a problem. We're about to run into a problem. Let me go ahead and say this again. I'm not trying to, trying to get into the text, but to this day, I, I love I love apologetics, and um, we call it you know, defending the faith. And some skeptics will argue. They'll say, um, there's no way this could be you know, the, the inspired Word of God. You can't trust the Bible because it was written by men with an agenda. It was written by men who had an agenda to spread. They just wanted to spread that agenda and nothing else. That's all it was. It, it's incredibly silly. If I'm, if I'm writing something to have an agenda, I want it to look as good as possible. And what do you think about when you see the disciples throughout the Gospels? You don't say, oh, what clean men. You say, what nonsense. 
They can't get anything right for a long time. What do you think about these, these men who are following Christ? In, in, in certain pages, in certain chapters, they're almost goofy. They're not always put in a positive light. Many of which are eventually killed for their faith. They died for a, for a lie, so to speak. Same thing here, looking at this problem we're about to encounter. Why would you include all these things that make the church look bad? Because the Spirit's not a liar. He tells the truth. And if there's anything I love about seeing things like this in the Scriptures, it's this. God's still using messy people. He's been using messy people since the beginning. And He's still doing it. And He's still doing it for His glory. And He's still doing it for our benefit. And so, for many people, they come to this section that we're about to encounter, and they say, this is a big problem in the Scriptures. We shouldn't be seeing this kind of argument happen between believers. I'm here to tell you it reassures me. It doesn't scare me one bit. If anything, it makes me feel better about my lowly, rotten self, knowing that God will somehow still use me and my flaws. The same for all of us. And see, if, there's, if, there's, if there's anything you get out of that part, don't go home saying, there shouldn't be an argument in the Scriptures. No, so say, no, 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 no. They're men. They're people. They're fallen human beings. He can use me too. So, this will sound familiar. Let's, let's get moving. Verse 36 of Acts 15. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. I'm not using any clever points this morning, but I want to recall something. We addressed this a while back in this very book. What you see in verse 36 is discipleship, okay? You're seeing discipleship. Paul and Barnabas have been in Antioch, the text says, after some days. We don't know what that is. It could be literally a few days, most likely several months. They were probably there for a while, sitting and teaching. Uh, I highly doubt it was just a few days. And so Paul goes to Barnabas, he says, all the cities we visited, all the places we went, all the places we spread the gospel and shared the, shared the gospel and, and preached boldly, all those places in which we saw churches come together and preach so diligently the cross and the resurrection, let's go back and see how they're doing. And when we think of Paul, we tend to call him a church planter. You ask anybody, just kind of, what's your first thoughts? Think about Paul. A lot of times he gets called a church planter. And that's appropriate. That's fine. There's all kinds of different ways to describe him. He certainly was to an extent. There's actually a really good book. There's, there's, there's several. There's several books on, on Paul's strategy for church planning. They are good. There's one thing missing out of one book that I'm thinking of. There's one section missing that talks about uh, Paul's strategy to be a church planner. It stops right there. It says he was a church planner and that's it. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Paul was not solely a church planner. I think if Paul were sitting here this very morning, he would say, I'm not a church planner, I'm a disciple. Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple who makes disciples. We can call him a church planner, that's fine. Some people also say, well, he's an evangelist. He, he's a great evangelist, but at the very heart of it, he's a disciple. He is a, is a disciple of the Lord. I don't want this to sound like a criticism, but when you hear the term church planner, you envision a guy who goes to a place, starts a church, it becomes viable, and then he goes on to, and does the next one. And that's it. We need more church planters, by the way. We need more and more churches planting across the nation, across the globe. But it doesn't stick around. It goes on to the next one. There's nothing wrong with that. When you think of evangelists, what do you think of? When you hear the word, I should say traveling. When you hear the word traveling evangelists, what comes to mind? A lot of equipment, a lot of bags, maybe a big truck, goes to city from city and does what? Stops in, preaches the gospel. On the next. All in all. Again, it's a good thing. I'm not, I'm not, it's not like I'm critical of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But Paul is a different animal, okay? Very different animal. He's a church planner, he's an evangelist, but he's also a disciple maker. And I will take that title over in you. A disciple maker of what we pass off as evangelists. I'll say that every day of the week. Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. A while back we had a sermon in which we said we want to make disciples, not decisions. And I stand by for this. I do. At the sake of sounding like I'm against mass evangelism, and I'm not. Please don't get the wrong thing. I'm not. We need to be realistic. We need to be very, very realistic. 
far too many times I've witnessed it, you've witnessed it. You've seen many men and women become emotional in their decision to accept Jesus into their heart, and then by the time the weekend is over, they've forgotten about it. It's over. It's done. It doesn't stick. It was an emotional draw to be in the moment. It could be peer pressure. It could be just the emotions. I don't know. Who knows? There's all kinds of different reasons. But when someone hears the call of the gospel and feels the call of Christ, and they're surrounded by people passionate for the Lord, and they're poured into, and they're held accountable, and they're loved home, and they're told to follow me as I follow Christ, infinitely better. Infinitely better than just give me your decision. So show me disciple makers, not decisions. That disciple will then go on and do something else. This is, this is the beauty of natural discipleship, what we call organic people. This is, this is the beauty. True biblical disciples, what do they do? They make what? Say again. They make disciples, then what do those disciples do? They make more. And then so on and so forth. On and on it goes. You can have a mass event where people may or may not make a decision that day and forget about it, or you can make disciples of a long lineage of never-ending disciple making. I'll take that all day, every day. Every day of the week I will take that. And it's just so difficult within personal evangelism. It sounds like I'm trying to be critical. I'm not. It's just so difficult to do this within personal evangelism. We still need it. Don't get, don't get the wrong idea. But most importantly, we need to see the importance of discipleship. I would never argue that traveling evangelists don't have love. I would never argue that. But it's, it's, a, it's a forced, general love that they must have. You don't know the players for Clemson or Carolina personally, do you? You might know one or two. You don't know them, do you? But you love the team. That's how they have, almost have to look at people. I, I love this crowd, but I don't know you. And I'm not going to know you after this. It's just a very general love. And people ask, well, okay, if that's true, then how do you make disciples? And how do you make disciples who will then go on to make disciples? Yes, there are strategies, there are formulas, there are all kinds of different ways in which we think about this, many of which are very, very helpful. But if you want to sum it up in one word, it's right here, it's love. It's love. You want to sum up the heart of discipleship that's found in, in love. And I'm a strategy guy, by the way. I'm all about strategy, I'm all about planning, I'm all about formulas. Let me tell you this, if it's missing love, it is fruitless and it is pointless. There is no point. We can sit back and have strategy meeting after strategy meeting. If there is not love present, none of it matters. does not matter at all. This goes with, with many other things. Let me show you what I mean with, with Paul. Uh, we're looking at Paul as a disciple maker. We're seeing the motive, okay? Listen to this. First, that's, don't turn it. Just listen. This is, this, is the, this is the disciple maker Paul we're talking about. First Thessalonians 2, 7-8. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children, having so fond an affection for you. Just, just listen to the language. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Because you had become very dear to us. You, you see this in every letter, he writes. Even when he corrects people, he's, he's sitting there saying, I love you people. I love you. Galatians 4. This is a hard one. Listen to this. This is a tough one. He's writing to the church in Galatia concerning their sliding back in their faith. Okay, so he's, he's writing to correct them. Listen to Paul as he writes as a concerned parent. Galatians 4, 19 through 20. Excuse me, 18 through 20. But it is good always to be equally sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you, my children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I wish. I, or, excuse me, I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. I mean, he's a, a caring parent. Saying, what happened? You know how much I, 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 I toiled over you? He said, do you remember the gospel call? You remember all that we went through together? What happened? And he writes as a concerned parent to a child. 
Another example of, of love. Philippians 1, verses 3 through 5. I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in, it, in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And then again, verses 7 through 8. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Does that sound like an impersonal evangelist to you? No. No. That's, there's nothing impersonal in those words. And that's deep. And that's, that's absolute love for people. It's filled with love. He was not after a quick decision. Paul was never after a quick decision. No, he was after disciples. He loved people. He cared about their spiritual maturity. He cared about their sanctification. He cared about their, their holiness, their hearts. It's a wonderful example of a biblical church planner, a biblical evangelist, and a biblical disciple man. So someone might hear all this and they'll say, okay, well, the first step in disciple making is loving others. So the first real motive we have to have is a love for people. That's where disciple making starts. We love people. Wrong. The very first step in making disciples is loving God. You can't love other people unless you love God. You don't even know what love is apart from God. We, we think we figured out what love is. The world thinks it has too. We have no idea. Apart from God, we don't know what love is. In a very, very general sense, perhaps, in terms of true, from the heart, deep, meaningful love, we have, we have no idea. So the subject doesn't begin with loving others, it begins with loving God. Because when we do love God, it's only then we can have any idea of what it means to love someone else. And it's only through the lens of loving God that we see people for who they really are. Going back to Genesis, people created in the image of God. It's only through a love for Him that we can look at men and women inside and outside this church and say, you were made in the image of God. And because He cares, I care. Because He loves, I love. It's only possible in this way. And so again, we come up with strategies, we come up with programs, we come up with ministries, but if they don't have love, I ask you, what is the point? They mean nothing. They are empty. We may get a decision every now and then, but we will never make disciples. If you joined us for our study of the spiritual gifts, long lasting effect on my personal life, I hope the same for you on Wednesday nights. Paul writes that we can use our gifts, but if we do so without love, what is it? You remember that? I, I heard it. Different ways of saying it, but it's just it's just noise. It's just a ringing symbol. It's just brass in the air. It's nothing. Because if you do all these things, if you try to practice your gift and you don't have any love, you're just noise, empty noise. Makes you want to do this. Turn that off. It's nothingness. Absolute emptiness. That should scare us, I think. That should truly, truly scare us. It's devastating. The other thing is people see through it. You know. You know when there's true love and when there's not any, any type of true love. It's just empty love. We all know this. We're all people who can, who can spot it. People should be able to clearly see the love for God in us. When they don't, they're not interested in what we have to say. They know it's fake. Again, it might sound like I'm just throwing off on people this morning. I'm not trying to, except for maybe right now. But um, you've all seen an attempt at discipleship without love before, I would imagine. You've all seen it at some point. Uh, I, I'm, I, again, I, if it offends anyone, I, I apologize. But I've seen Jehovah's Witnesses come by many times. I've had plethora of conversations with them. Many, many times. Have good conversations. Ninety-nine percent of them have been civil. There's been one instance where we got a little riled up with each other. He didn't see things my way. <laughs> the whole time I knew I was looking for a number. The entire time I was a status quo. I was a quota to meet. And by the way, they're doing great work, going door to door, writing notes, taking notes, paying attention. But you know what? The sad part about all that is they have no idea who I am. Not, not, not. Yes, Mister. James, Annie? They don't know me. They don't know me. 
but they had no idea who I am. It's just, it's just masquerading as love. And it's so sad that people put all this effort into something that is an absolute lie. Well, we know the truth, don't we? I know, I can spot fake love when they come knocking at your door. You've seen it before, too. If I gave them bad news, they wouldn't hurt with me. I'm just a number. Just a person. On a piece of paper. Now, I think what, what kills me the most is I have answers. I mean, I have questions. I have statements. And they'll say, well, here's a pamphlet. Read this and we'll come back to you. Well, what do we do? And so I can say all this stuff and throw up on Jehovah's Witnesses, but what about us? Are we showing the deep, meaningful love in action to people? Are we hurting? Are we crying with others? Are we reaching into the very depths of our soul and saying this person is a human being created in the image of God? And we need to get the gospel urgently to our neighbors, both near and far. Are we doing that? All the while, false teachers and false religions based on false gods will work their tail, tails off for a lie, and we have the truth. The equation doesn't, doesn't add up. We're not going to make the problem that's 15. What we'll do is we'll do this. Um, tonight, um, I'd, love to, I'd love to see you here. I'd love for you to come tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll continue on. We'll finish up Acts 15 uh, this evening. I'll push what I have and, and we'll do that. But um, This morning we need to understand our, our motive. That's, that's kind of key. We already have time. We need to understand our motive for discipleship. We need to understand our motive for ministry. Our motive for all that we do in church. What's the reason? What is the reason? I think one of the big problems is this. And it's, it's kind of hard to even put this into words. But a lot of times we'll say, you know, we need to make disciples. And we'll say, why do we need to make disciples? And we'll say, well, because we need to. It's just a circular argument. I think there's a real truth when we say we need to make disciples because, number one, we're commanded to. But number two, we love people. We want them to know the Lord. We want them to know the gospel. And so we'll do whatever it takes to take that message to them. Right here, and maybe even overseas. Sometimes we just get in the way and make these things too difficult on ourselves. Well, the answer to all of them has been show love, invest time, effort into making disciples who will then go on to make disciples. The answer is biblical love, not programs. Biblical love, not systems. Biblical love. Not putting all of our hopes and dreams in the things that will fail. But putting to the one promise that Paul says, if you have this, you have this one thing, you'll be edifying one another. You'll be reaching out to others. That's love. Make no mistake about this, and I'll close here. Our zeal and our passion, our, our deep longing and love for God, that is what will determine our efforts and our work in making disciples and loving our neighbor both near and far. If you want to know the answer to making disciples, how do we do it? Go on your knees in prayer, confession, profession to God. Our efforts and what we do in loving our neighbors and following the great commandment, it is only as far as our zeal and our passion for God is. Without that, there is no B. Without A, there is no B. It doesn't exist. So let's remember this going forward. We want to be people who move forward and make disciples. We need to understand our primary motive, and that's love. Mm -hmm.